The Barewa Old Boys Association deserves a commendation for hosting these lectures on national development through the years. Indeed, uh, just looking through, uh, you will notice that as from 1986, almost consistently with a few breaks here and there, we've had this series of lectures on issues of national development. But more so, they deserve our commendation for the choice of subjects of the lectures that have all been focused on how to hold our nation, our society, and its leadership to the promise of higher and nobler standards. <coughs> our leadership, our society, our nation must always be held to that promise of higher, of nobler standards. The great college, this great college, Barewa College, has nurtured some of the brightest, most courageous, and most patriotic minds that our nation has ever seen. The great visionary, Sir Amadou Belo Sadao Sokoto, who is responsible for ensuring the galvanization of northern Nigeria into the federal system that our nation has become. His incredible foresight has led to a lot of the educational development that northern Nigeria has experienced especially in those early days. Nigeria's first Prime Minister, Alaji Tafawa Balewa, the golden voice of Africa, <laughs> whose vision for a united Nigeria which stood the challenges of time. And up till today, his vibrant words of unity continue to echo and resonate amongst us. It was he who said, and I quote, we must recognize our diversity and the peculiar conditions under which the different tribal communities live. The federal system is under the present conditions the only sure basis on which Nigeria will remain united." End of quote. <laughs> Sir Kashim Ibrahim, first indigenous governor general of northern Nigeria, and of course Malam Aminu Khan, perhaps Nigeria's most articulate proponent of a pathway for social justice, especially in a desperately, especially in a desperately poor society. And I'll come back to that. And General Mutala Mohammed, who was killed as he courageously led an attempt at a Nigerian and African ethical and moral rebirth. And of course, today's chair and former head of state who by the sheer hand of God led the country when there was an existential need to declare to a divided country that there was no victor and no vanquished. <laughs> Alaji Shehu Shagari, Nigeria's first executive, vice, uh, executive president. Frankly, I do not know of any other Nigerian institution whose products have so definitively defined the cause and content of Nigeria's history, such as Barewa College. <laughs> that sort of pervasive influence has its positives and negatives, but that is for another day. The fact that the substance and tone of the lectures in these series have sought to focus the nation's mind on the most potent challenges and its greatest opportunities for remedy or redemption give me very high expectations of the lecture on the challenges of the judiciary to democracy. The Nigerian perspective, the lecture so brilliantly delivered by His Royal Highness uh, Alaji Lawa Hazan Gum, retired justice, retired chief judge, of the federal of the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory. And his lordship largely meets those expectations, as he clearly makes the point about the importance of separation of powers, the centrality of the rule of law, and the importance of respect 
for the adjudicatory conclusions of our courts, whether they are palatable or they are not palatable. His Lordship expectedly gives a pass mark to the judiciary, his own uh, constituency. And I quote him where he says, by and large, over the years, the judiciary has remained faithful to the Constitution and by extension, democracy, by ensuring fair hearing and guarding against violations of democratic norms. Ultimately, the aim of the judiciary is to maintain cohesion in a society by arbitrating between man and man, as well as man and state. In Nigeria, I have no doubt that the judiciary, the judiciary has gone a long way in achieving this, notwithstanding the enormous challenges being encountered. End of quote. I believe that his lordship is right, that the judiciary has served a most useful purpose. I'm not entirely certain, though, that his lordship has been as fair to the executive. Certainly, uh, I do not believe that, the, that uh, his lordship's entire conclusion on the executive have been entirely fair. So perhaps there's a need to correct some of the premises upon which His Royal Highness's observations are based so that we do not end up diminishing the very crucial points that his Lordship makes. My Lord's assertion that nothing, and I, I, and, and I am used to calling uh, His Royal Highness my Lord, so please excuse me because as you know, I mean, if you appear before uh, their Lordships, you just get used to my Lord. I don't, I mean, any time I have to say Royal Highness, I get stuck. But my Lord, <laughs> my Lord's assertion that nothing has changed with regard to democratic conduct, even in this administration, is not, in my respectful view, borne out by the facts. For with respect, the relationship of the executive and the National Assembly, and I think it's fair to say that the executive, especially this uh, current executive, has refrained from interfering, first with the National Assembly's choice of its leadership and the conduct of its affairs, even though, <laughs> even though sometimes there are those who will argue that that is detrimental and has considerably slowed down the work of the executive. But it has afforded us a valuable learning process. There has been no attempt under this government to stampede the legislature. It's easy to forget that Nigeria had five Senate presidents between 1999 and 2007. Very easy to forget. Several governors in the years gone by were forcefully impeached by legislatures acting on the presumed behest of the federal government. Many of us remember Joshua Darye, impeached by five legislatures at about 6 a.m. in 2006. The five-man House of Assembly met under tight security and impeached the governor. Immediately after that, Michael Botman was sworn in as governor. Peter Obi, the same Peter Obi, was impeached by legislators who moved into Oka at 5 a.m. and began sh sitting shortly thereafter. The House of Assembly members arrived at about 5 a.m. and made short order of impeaching uh, the then governor of Anambra State. Same as Chris Ngige was abducted by police officers. I'm sure many of us will remember. The Anambra State Parliament claiming, and in fact, they are, at that time, you know, it was, it was said that uh, the governor had resigned. And uh, the, the, the chief judge was promptly ordered to swear in his deputy, Okechuku Ude, who immediately at the time assumed the functions of the state governor. Although the police later claimed at some point that they were taking the governor into protective custody, the embattled governor reiterated that he was abducted as hundreds of his supporters from the 21 local governments at the time welcomed him back to State House. The truth of the matter is that there have been several different violations, violations of that honored relationship 
between the executive and the judiciary. Many of us remember Rashid Lajoja, who was also impeached in 2006. His impeachment was upturned by the Supreme Court. Perhaps my Lord may be excused for, about forgetting the assault in 2014 on the National Assembly by the then executive. But my brother, His Excellency, the governor of Sokoto State, will not forget. <laughs> as, as then he was the Right Honorable Speaker, and many of his colleagues resorted to acrobatics to scale the walls, to scale the walls of the National Assembly, which was then blocked, apparently, by executive order. When my Lord excused that government uh, from uh, any forms of uh, misbehavior, I was, I was surprised. I was Attorney General in Lagos when the executive withheld the funds due to our local government and due to our state. We were not able to recover it despite the Supreme Court's order until after we had left office. In the same period, and when I say the same period, I refer again to 2013-2014, and I make these points because uh, my Lord had mentioned that uh, perhaps only that the governments of uh, Umar al-Sheu uh, Yaradua as well as uh, Jonathan should be excused. But that same period, 2013 to 2014, if you recall, the Governor's Forum uh, came under severe executive interference, just even the governor's forum. If you remember the whole controversy as to whether 16 is greater than 19, <laughs> you know, indeed 16 was held at the time to be greater than 19. You will agree with me that a lot of what we're seeing today, and if you recall also, you know, the executive uh, at the time, the national executive, how it besieged the River State Government House. All of this took place in very recent history. You'll agree with me that a lot has changed, at least with respect to that. We are no longer seeing those sorts of things. The government has also taken, and you, if you recall, in more recent times, significant steps in terms of police reforms, and we hope that these police reforms will come into fruition. Under President Buhari, the National Assembly is, in my view, perhaps at its most independent since 1999. <laughs> These changes are being brought about through democratic processes. And to some extent, despite the, despite the tensions that must always exist between the executive and the legislature, these changes and all of these changes are still done and they're still being made. Unsuccessful attempts have been made in the past to bring about a holistic financial autonomy of the legislature and judiciary in Nigeria. It is, however, under this administration that we have ensured that that financial autonomy has been extended to state judiciaries and state houses of assembly. <laughs> My Lord also appeared to be a bit dissatisfied with the slogan that change begins with the individual. He says instead, and I do agree with him, that the change must also begin with us, that is to say, the executive. But it was the great uh, Mahatma Gandhi who charged us all to be the change that we want to be, to want to see. Any change that we want to see in this world, the great Gandhi charged us to be that change. It is a call to civic responsibility. And it's not an excuse, and I agree entirely with his lordship, it's not an excuse for leadership to shirk its own responsibilities. But permit me to say that the change in our nation may not be as difficult to see as all that. Clearly, all of what we expect to see is not, we have not seen all we expect to see. But today, if we were to ask our brothers and sisters in the Northeast, who watched Boko Haram seize 14 local governments 
as of 2014 and hoist their flags in 14 different local governments. And they saw schools and major roads closed and, would not even, and could not even celebrate Salah or Christmas for many years. Then perhaps we will find that they will say that they have seen some change. If we were to ask the farmers, who are the 720,000 farmers who today are enjoying the credit and support and agricultural inputs being made by the Anchor Borrowers Program and getting a more stable supply of fertilizer because of the Presidential Fertilizer Initiative and also getting it at significantly cheaper prices. Perhaps they might say that there has been some change. Or, 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 if, or if we were to ask the 500,000 graduates who have been employed under the Empire Program, and this Empire Program is direct government employment, and they are trained using a tablet such as the one I'm holding, in various entrepreneurial skills, code writing and all sorts of things, to be useful to themselves even after the period of their employment. If we were to ask them, perhaps they might say that they've seen some change. If we were to ask the pensioners, the Nigeria Airways staff, Delta Steel Company staff, ex-Biafra police officers, etc., who before now received no pensions after several years of abandonment, perhaps they might say, there is some change. And the petty traders, and the petty traders who are getting microcredit from the federal government, many of them, hundreds of thousands, like doing two million, who are getting direct credit, they were long ignored. Nobody ever paid attention to the poorest in the value chain, to the poorest of our people. No one ever paid attention to, the, to their welfare. Today, they are getting some credit. They are opening bank accounts on account of a government program. Perhaps they might say that they have seen some change. Or better still, if we were to ask, if we were to ask, or better still, if we were to ask the 9.2 million school children and their parents in 48,000 schools in 26 states nationwide who are eating one meal a day. Perhaps they will say that certainly I see some change. 297,000 indigent Nigerians in 20 states now receiving monthly stipends under the conditional cash transfer program. 297,000 of them. All of those ones, each of them, and their families, and the families that they represent, they wouldn't argue that there is no change. Ask the contractors who have returned to size since 2016 because our budget for roads has grown 20 fold since then. Ask the artisans and laborers who have found jobs on the many road, railroad projects and housing projects. There is no state, not a single state, and the Minister of Work, Power, Works and Housing is here in Sokoto today, it is here today. Not a single state in Nigeria is not undergoing, not in not one state, is there not a major federal government project today. As things presently stand, it is of course possible to say that politicians have nothing to show for the lessons of the failure of the First and Re Second Republics, as my Lord has argued. A lot of that impunity has come to define, a lot of the impunity, and I must say respectfully, that a lot of the impunity that has come to define public office in Nigeria in terms of corruption, especially grand corruption. The stealing of the corruption directly from the Treasury, we experienced in the past few years. Today, that's no longer the case. Today, you do not have a situation where under a government, 292 million dollars is taken from the Treasury in one day. 292 million dollars. And it simply disappeared. 292 million dollars, all of the money we are given to 2 million, uh, to, to 2 million vegetarians, is 20 billion. If you look at what that could do, a hundred in hundred million dollars is 36 billion. Almost a hundred billion is what we are talking about. Take it and share. If we have a hundred billion to give to our people, it's to be a different 
The days of fraudulent oil contracts, where three billion dollars were disappeared, and not paid back, even as the steel press is probably in getting back. All of these, the days of the disappearance of large sums of money, at least that has stopped. We have stopped land corruption. We have stopped the plan where we are able to stop contractual corruption. We haven't even got to that point. And it shows you the extent of the problem. It shows you how big the problem is. For God helping us, our country will be transformed. Our country will change. We will deal with this issue of our country will change. The policy of this government, of direct procurement, in respect to uh, security, has helped it with security put direct procurement of security. I help it with But then uh, I don't want to uh, dwell on all of that. And all of what we have seen, all of what we have seen in the various ways by which we have tried to ensure that the lessons of the past, especially with land production, have been dealt with. This day, the government is achieving far more than this. We are earning 60% less than the previous government, 60%. And we have spent 2.7 trillion in Ireland on infrastructure on capital, the largest capital spend in the history of our country. I think it is safe to say that some lessons have been learned. But let me just very quickly go on. And I would like to say that it is in the area of justice that we have perhaps some of the most important challenges. And when I say justice, I mean, even our definition of justice. The truth is that the Nigerian elite sees justice from the point of view of how we, the elite, are treated. So if a member of our, of our company, a member of our group, when I say our group, I refer to the political, the religious, and the business elite, they detect. We suddenly begin to shout, injustice, injustice. Justice for the majority of our people who are poor, who are dispossessed, has a different definition. And this is why, as a lawyer, I was greatly inspired by the thoughts of Madam Amin Ogham. And I say that I was greatly inspired by his thoughts because he understood what the concept of social justice then? What is the point of justice when hundreds, when millions of our people experience a type of poverty that makes it difficult to describe the human? What is the point of justice? The Indian courts, the Indian Supreme Court, in defining what it is to have the right to life, when the Indian court talks about the right to, to life, he said that what that right to life has been denied if a person does not have access to social welfare, if a person does not have access to health, to health care, to education, that right to life has been denied. That is the view of Madame That our country must provide for the steaming for that justice, especially what the concept of distributed justice. The concepts that underlie the fact that the whole purpose of government and government is to ensure the world tells them. That is just. And we must ensure that that form of just becomes the norm in our nation. Let me again thank and commend uh, my Lord for this, for this lecture. I will look at it again in greater detail now that I have a full copy. I'll look at it in greater detail. I'm to write my thoughts and send uh, to, to my own. I want to thank you very much.